one o'clock, what's going on. All right. Uh, welcome. The show is What's Going On. I'm your host, Hugo Fernandez. And uh, it's our first show back uh, since the summer. And my first guest I'm very uh, excited to have on is uh, Dr. Clarence Taylor, uh, Professor Emeritus of both Baruch College and the CUNY Graduate Center. And uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about uh, the 50s and 60s civil rights movement and the lessons that uh, they, it has for the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't say that Dr. Taylor uh, has published several books, uh, including Fight the Power, uh, African Americans and the Long History of Police Brutality in New York City, uh, Civil Rights in New York City from World War II to the Giuliani Era, and uh, Black Religious Intellectuals, the Fight for Equality from Jim Crow to the 21st Century. Uh, welcome, Dr. Taylor. Thank you, I'm very happy to be here. And uh, So I'm, I'm gonna call you Clarence for the, yes. for the rest of the show, Dr. <laughs> so I don't- uh, A lot easier, right? Yeah, it is. Uh, but I like, you know, I, I say, you know, I only have a master's, so the folks who get PhDs, I, I typically go around calling them doctor because I know how hard they worked for it. Uh, so I just want to talk a little bit, by the way, those of you who are regulars of my show realize I didn't start the show with, the, with the theme music, what's going on, but you'll see there's, it's intermingled in the, in that cut. Uh, it, I actually decided to do this after our yammering this semester, uh, opening sessions where I asked, uh, some folks what they thought their best, their favorite Martin Luther, I mean, uh, Marvin Gaye cut was. And uh, Michelle Pizzo came back with uh, Inner City Blues, Make Me Want to Holler. So uh, that, and it haunted me ever since. Uh, so I wanted to open our season and our show up with that. Uh, but let's talk about our guest. Clarence, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, yourself and uh, your background? Sure. Um, I was born in Brooklyn, New York. Um, went to public schools uh, in Brooklyn. Um, I also attended public college. I uh, was a student at Brooklyn College. I got my uh, bachelor's degree there. Uh, I then went on to New York uh, University um, where I got a master's degree in special education. So I graduated in the mid 1970s during the financial crisis in New York City. Oh, yeah. And jobs are hard to come by. I did want to teach uh, history, uh, what they call social studies, but uh, there were no jobs. So I uh, was told that uh, special education was uh, uh, an up-and-coming field. So I got a master's degree there. Um, and I did become a special education teacher for a number of years. Uh, but uh, interesting, I went back to Brooklyn College to uh, take courses, in particular courses um, that uh, in the master's degree and uh, courses that would uh, add to my salary because that was a requirement in New York City. And I, I met a, a professor there in history, uh, Professor Hans Lewis Trafis, who convinced me to go to graduate school <laughs> and get a PhD. So I applied and uh, at the Graduate Center, I uh, was accepted and I you know, got a PhD there in 1991. Uh, and uh, with a PhD in American history, uh, jobs are still hard to come by. <laughs> So I did get a position at Lemoyne College in Syracuse University, where I taught uh, for uh, five years, 91 to 96. And from 96, I went on to Florida International University. Oh, my God. You know, that's my that's my alma mater for undergrad. I didn't realize. Did you teach at the South Campus or the North Campus? I was well, I, I was on the North Campus. Uh, I was uh, in two departments. I was in history department and then what was known as the African New World Studies uh, uh, department. Uh, uh, yeah, program, I believe it was called, because it really didn't, it didn't offer an undergraduate degree, although it offered a master's degree. <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, I, I spent uh, a number of years at uh, Florida International University. In fact, I left in 2004 
uh, to come to the City University of New York at Baruch College, where I was offered a position in uh, teaching history. And uh, in 2006, I joined the uh, gr uh, faculty at the graduates and where I, I taught graduate courses in the civil rights movement. So you did the whole, you went the, the whole wheel and came, came around. Why'd you, why'd you leave Miami? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, was it basically because you got a better job or, or you, I mean, I know why I left Miami, but I was, you know, I'm a, I'm an artist and there, you know, though there's a lot of art down there, there are certain limitations, not nothing quite like New York city. Obviously. Well, yeah, in New York. I mean, my a lot of my work focuses on New York. I see. So uh, it was. It's always good to be close close to your sources. Uh, uh, in addition, it it was more up uh, more money. Uh, in addition, uh, great graduate students. Uh, right. At City University of New York uh, in, the, in the PhD program. So, um, I mean, for all those reasons, uh, New York was just a better fit for me. Right. And I, w I was going to ask you, as, as I was listening to you talk a little bit, uh, what do you think that professor of yours saw in you that, uh, you know, he, w that he encouraged you to go on to, to get the, the PhD in history? Was it something... Did you just did you just uh, seem to really enjoy his class, or uh, what was his thinking? You think? Yeah, well, in high school I was uh, very attracted to history, so I went to high school in the 1960s. Right. Uh, and this was a turbulent uh, decade. A <laughs> lot of <laughs> the least, yeah. Yes, um, a lot of activity taking place, a lot of social movements emerging uh, and having a uh, great impact. Uh, one of them being the civil rights movement. Of course, there's the anti-war movement, uh, the rise of the black power mo movement. And uh, I was really shaped by these uh, social protest movements. And I became interested in history in high school and um, with the encouragement of, with some good teachers. And I decided when I was going uh, to college, I was going to major in history. So uh, it was something I, you know, really, really loved. And so when I, I started taking these graduate courses, uh, my major objective was just to get enough credits <laughs> so I can get a higher salary. Right. But uh, Professor Hans Lewis Trafus, because you know, we, I really enjoyed uh, those history classes and his history class in particular, he, he, the class was on the, uh, the, uh, the American Civil War. And, uh, you know, I asked a lot of questions, you know, he knows that I was really interested in the reading and he just said, you know, you would really make a good professor. <laughs> so he said, you, <laughs> well, there you so go. He encouraged me and uh, I, I applied and I'm, I'm very thankful to uh, Professor Trafus. Oh, and I was also thinking with your background in special education, I bet you that makes you a very good teacher as well, because you know how to to work with folks who, you know, may struggle for whatever yeah. reasons. So I think that was helpful as well. Well, yes. And, and just and also high school teaching. Right. right. Teach high school. Yeah. Right. That which is yeah. very tough. I mean, I've, I have taught high school kids. I taught photography to high school kids. They're not easy, but. If you can get them engaged, you know, it's like any population, right? That's right. They, you can get some good stuff out of them. Yeah. Uh, you want to you want to talk a little bit about your career while you were at CUNY? Because I usually ask folks about, you know, what they hear at the college when I'm interviewing them about the things they've done here. You want to talk about some of what you think uh, uh, are, are some things that you were excited about while you were here? Because uh, in in, now you're retired. Obviously, we've, we talked about that before the show, but some of the things that you, when you were doing at Baruch and at the Graduate Center that you were involved with. Yeah, well, so when I, when I came to Baruch, uh, I immediately uh, created the, the course in African-American history. It was on, they had a course on the books there, but it uh, was this course that went from uh, the colonial period to the present. Uh, and I decided, no, you know, we need greater focus uh, and students need greater focus. So let's split that uh, into two courses. 
So I proposed uh, teaching a uh, having a course and move from 1865, uh, the end of the Civil War and Reconstruction, the beginning of Reconstruction to the present. And since I, it, it was no one was really teaching uh, that course in the history department, uh, it was uh, accepted and it attracted a lot of students. Uh, in addition, I uh, took, uh, created a course on the civil rights movement, uh, as well as a course on labor history. Uh, I should note, when I was in uh, graduate school, uh, my focus wasn't on African-American history, but it was on labor history. You know, oh. I, I, I worked with uh, Professor Herbert G. Gutman. Of who, Gutman College? The Gutman? V. Gutman, yes. <laughs> wow. I didn't realize it was named after a history professor. I thought it was yeah. some rich person or something. <laughs> yeah. No, this uh, Herbert G. Gutman was the most prominent historian on the American working class. Hmm. Very good. Uh, during that time. And so it was sort of an honor to be uh, in, in his uh, presence and in his class where he really uh, shaped my understanding of history by not focusing on political history, but much more on what we call social and cultural history. Right. Uh, and so, um, you know, looking at uh, the lives of slaves, uh, one, one book uh, that we read uh, had a, a wonderful uh, quote in it, uh, and it says, it's important to understand the writings of Thomas Jefferson it's also important to understand why Jefferson had the time to write. <laughs> when you, when you <laughs> right. Own, right. When you own hundreds of uh, human beings then, and you don't have to go out there and till the soil and labor, then it's a lot easier. And so uh, the historian said those people are also making history. Right. And so, you know, social historians, uh, Ask the question, you know, uh, how do we get at that history? Uh, it's much harder than someone who leaves their memoirs and, you know, their life's writings and so forth. But people who don't do that, uh, we have to find a way of doing that. And that was, it was, a, in that time, it, uh, it was an exciting field. Uh, 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 so American social history and government was one of the leading proponents of that field. So that, that shaped my work. And so, so at CUNY, I, uh, that was how I taught. That was my approach, you know, uh, my approach in the African-American history class, my approach in the uh, civil rights course, and uh, the course on uh, labor. Uh, I, I should also note uh, I was in the honors program, Macaulay's honors program, which is also very exciting when I was at uh, Baruch College. And I taught a course on uh, New York City. And I shaped that, even though it wasn't uh, a history course, I shaped it as a history course. Uh, but many students had no understanding of the social history uh, of New York City. Now, I was at the Graduate Center. Uh, I, I did teach uh, the course on the Civil Rights Movement. Uh, it was... Uh, once again, uh, we grew out of my sort of undergraduate uh, course uh, on the um, on the civil rights movement. Uh, this clearly was much more intense, and they were really excellent students there. And we really got a chance to explore the um, the most recent uh, literature on the American civil rights movement and the Black Power movement. Uh, and that was an extremely popular course, and I worked with grad students. Um, I uh, supervised uh, uh, a number of PhDs, uh, you know, dissertation. I was uh, supervised a number of dissertations, PhD dissertations when I was there. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I think that uh, I did make a mark at, at, at the Graduate Center. Um, the one problem. I, I should note. I don't know if you want me to go go into this at this point, but you can whatever you know. It's sure. it's, it's your show as well as mine. Sure. So <laughs> one problem I, I found at both Baruch and the Graduate Center was the lack of faculty of color. 
Yeah, well, we can talk about that for because I've been talking about that in my role in governance. It's been an issue for a while. And here at LaGuardia, it's something that we're looking at. Uh, I know we got this Mellon grant, which is very, uh, re I don't know if you're aware of this, the, the, the university got a Mellon grant, $10 million, that's supposed to focus on uh, ethnic and uh, African-American studies. I don't know if any of that is going to go towards addressing the issue that when a student walks in the room, do they see somebody in the front of that room that looks anything like them that mm -hmm. they identify with? But uh, yeah, it's a big issue close to, you know, my thinking. Uh, but if you'd like to talk about it, well, let's, let's do it. <laughs> yeah, sure. Sure. I mean, it's a, it's a problem we see uh, in many places, in many right. universities uh, and colleges. Um, and you know, I, I've made the argument that institutions really have to really work hard to go out and attract um, black and brown people to the faculty. Um, and we can't just keep using the more conventional ways of doing this. Right. Um, and using the, some, the sort of same measurement. <laughs> yes. To uh, decide who is uh, qualified and right. who isn't. So, uh, it, but it's it's a battle because you have to convince uh, not just the administration. You also have to you know convince your colleagues, faculty members, of uh, sort of walking away from sort of the old ways, or at least considering other ways of of, of uh, deciding uh, who's qualified <laughs> right. to uh, work with uh, undergraduate and graduate students. Yeah, what the qualifications are, uh, for example, that they uh, resemble the students they're teaching. Yeah. And uh, I, for me, it's I've found, you know, because one of the, the data shows we, we do hire folks, but we lose them faster than we can hire them. So for me, it's, I mean, you're right, this is a big piece of it, is what do we look for in a new hire? But then I've also found that an important area we need to deal with is how do we keep these people? How do we make them feel welcome? How do we help right. them thrive, survive? Uh, is very important. How to, you know, inclusion is the big, uh, it's a big piece. But support, and uh, you know, it's a, and I tell people, it's like you're. This is a battle you fight every day. You know, that's right. Make people feel welcome, to make them feel included, to support them in their process. Uh, so that they thrive and see, because, you know, we can hire all the people we want if we can't keep them. And it, it's actually, you know, of course, good people, you are competing with other people for them. And so you can lose them. You could hire them and they don't stick around. And if you've, you've got a place, for example, CUNY is kind of, well, at least in the community colleges, we have a reputation as having a very high workload. Why would somebody, right. I lost, we lost a fabulous uh, colleague who, uh, uh, who West Indian, a uh, faculty member, a man of color, to uh, St. John's. And he told me at the time, he says, I had to leave because I couldn't finish my PhD with the workload. And that's why he left. He didn't, it wasn't like, you know, he wanted to be at St. John's. In fact, he really struggled there because there the lack of diversity uh, in any way. Uh, and now, gratefully, he's at Queens College. Uh, so we got him back, but at the time he just couldn't be here because of the workload. So there's a lot of, yeah, this is a, a tough battle and I, and, uh, I talk about it when I can and try to help people understand. And you're right. It's, uh, the administration sometimes I feel is even more understanding than our colleagues <laughs> oh, <laughs> in yeah, these cases yeah. because yeah. they're being judged by the statistics, uh, right. as far as what percentage of your faculty are made up of folks from the, uh, what we call the underrepresented groups. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's a bit, yeah, changing our colleagues is a big issue. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, it's both. I mean, I mean, you have to persuade administrators also to to provide the resources. Yeah. And that uh, I see as a, a problem in, in some places. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, it's an ongoing battle that uh, I, now I think it's also having an impact, at least when I was at Baruch, um, black male students, their numbers were dropping dramatically. Uh, and, you know, we, I tried to get uh, both faculty and the administration to, to address that problem. And how did they respond? 
uh, the, the administration did um, try some ways of, of attracting um, uh, black, more black students uh, through recruiting. Uh, but the, the big problem, uh, of course, was, uh, you know, all the essentially requirements that they, 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 the criteria for getting into the institution. Uh, and, uh, you know, in terms of SAT scores and so forth. And, th I mean, I think that was a sort of problem that uh, administrators and faculty uh, didn't want to, uh, to address. Wow. So, uh, you know, the numbers just, uh, when I left in 2017, I know they were uh, very low in terms of black uh, male students. Do you think I mean, that's something called the Black Male Initiative? Right. We have that at LaGuardia uh, as well. Yeah. BMAC. Uh, my question is that once they got to the institution, did they, again, this issue of did they feel welcome? Did they see themselves as a part of that institution or did they feel alien uh, yeah. in a sense? And who sticks around where they don't feel welcome or they don't feel represented in a lot of different ways? I mean, right. it's, uh, it's, it's complicated. Yeah, it is a complicated problem. Yeah. I wonder but if those one thing you need to address, though. If, if no, yeah, know. that just be, and I say this too, just because it's hard doesn't yeah. mean we don't try to deal, you know, look at it. And I think a lot of times folks who, who see these difficult problems and they don't know how to address them, uh, you know, just shut down and uh, aren't prepared to uh, try to figure out how it, you know, it's not going to be easy. But it's, again, like you said, it's, it needs addressing. Right. Uh, well, you know, what's interesting is, and maybe we can start moving into what uh, I initially billed the show about, uh, is that you told me, which is kind of fascinating, and not only the FIU connection, by the way, uh, our, our, the station director, uh, Jamie Riccio, graduated from the Cy Newhouse School of Broadcasting in Syracuse. So there's, uh, another, there's another connection. Another connection. For, yeah. There's another connection for us, is that... Uh, a book that I've been reading uh, to try to understand some things, uh, Bearing the Cross, was a Pulitzer Prize winning book by David J. Garrow. Uh, he was your, uh, he was on your dissertation committee, right? He was. Uh, that's right, yes. And so that's a, a kind of a fortuitous connection. I've been just, I mean, I, I, I explained that I've been reading it. Uh, it's a book I've wanted to read for a long, long time, and of course, never found the time to finish it. And I just recently, you know, have list, been listening to it as an audio text uh, while I sleep, believe it or not, if you can imagine, like waking, waking, you know, you wake up, you can't sleep and I start listening and sometimes I fall and I'll wake up, you know, all of a sudden I'm on, you know, the mall and <laughs> he's doing the famous, I've got, I have a dream speech, but mostly it's a lot of other things going on. Mm -hmm. uh, but that, this text has, you know, provoked me in this, as I read it, is this, that you know, there are a lot of lessons in there about how to go about doing uh, that kind of work, about uh, organizing people to deal with issues in uh, in society. And I felt, I'm wondering if we had learned those lessons and if the folks in the Black Lives Movement are employing them right now. And so in that, I, I searched for a civil rights expert and, and you know, fortuitously found you. And uh, I want to talk about that. I mean, and I don't know how you want to start this conversation. If you want to talk, say anything about Garrow or the, or the text, or uh, if you have your own sure. ideas that you want to talk about. Sure. No, no. It's, it's one of the best books on not only Martin Luther King Jr., but the civil rights movement. And uh, David, uh, by the way, I'll hold it up here. So it's not a it's not a plug to buy it, but just in case you're wondering. <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah, uh, yeah. And uh, David worked uh, a long time on that on that work, uh, but he also wrote other works. I mean, that his interest was on Martin Luther King Jr. and uh, the Civil Rights Movement. So, um, you know, he has a book before this called you know, March to Selma. Uh, he also wrote a book uh, looking at uh, Martin Luther King and the FBI. Uh, 
uh, and their campaign to undermine um, King and the civil rights movement. Yeah, which the book, so, book touches on many times. Yes, that's right. So, uh, so yeah, he, he is uh, clearly one of the uh, uh, experts, uh, leading experts uh, on the, the civil rights movement. And yeah, reading uh, his work uh, while I was in graduate school, and of course, meeting him at the Graduate Center uh, was a, an amazing experience. And David was gracious, and uh, you know, I took a course with him, and uh, I was finishing my uh, coursework um, when I first met him and uh, told him about my work uh, with my dissertation, and he uh, graciously agreed to be on the dissertation committee. And it was, it was a wonderful committee. I had Eric Foner, from, uh, who had just left the Graduate Center to go to Columbia University, but he decided he would stay at, at, and work with me, uh, as well as others who were uh, from the, the uh, Graduate Center. Um, the um, the uh, dissertation was on the Black Churches of Brooklyn. Um, the book that you one of your texts, right? That's right. That was the first book. You know, that was my dissertation, and I uh, shaped it into a book. Uh, the first book that I uh, had published. So, uh, but as I said, the, the, the major focus on the, all my work is on sort of social history, not looking at individuals. So, and, and Garrow clearly was doing this, and and. Um, bearing the cross, but it's, it's also a social history. It's not just a, a, a political history. Uh, uh, and so, like I said, it's not just a, a book on the uh, Martin Luther King, but it is a wonderful book looking at the southern wing of the civil rights movement. And my, my interest, I should note here, because there were other scholars working on, before Garrow and after Garrow working on the civil rights movement, look, uh, working on Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, what I wanted to do is move out of sort of conventional history and look uh, elsewhere. You know, uh, this is all was going on in the South, as we are told by uh, the um, uh, essentially the literature, uh, the learning right. literature. Uh, the question I had, well, what was going on in other places? of the country. Right. Uh, let's and, take a let's take a let's stop right there with that question. <laughs> so I can sure. do a quick station break. Uh, you're watching and listening to WLGR LaGuardia Web Radio. I'm uh, the host of uh, today's show What's Going On Hugo Fernandez and my guest is uh, Dr. Clarence Taylor who is a professor emeritus from Baruch College and the CUNY Graduate Center and is also uh, published many books, including Fight the Power, African Americans and the Long History of Police Brutality in New York City, Civil Rights in New York City from World War II to the Giuliani era, and Black Religious Intellectuals, the Fight for Equality from Jim Crow to the 21st century. And the topic is the 50s and 60s Civil Rights Movement and uh, what it has to teach us as we are now in the Black Lives Matter movement. So to get back uh, where you were at, is you were saying the other areas to look at, right? Yes. Rather than the, the, yeah. so talk about that. And, and my interest was uh, on the largest city in the uh, in the nation, New York. Um, and the evidence is pretty clear. Uh, the question you know, I raised uh, was what the heck was going on in the 1950s uh, and 1960s in New York while we had this growing national civil rights movement uh, located uh, in the South. Well, the find it was clear that there, <laughs> there was a pretty intense civil rights struggle taking place. Uh, in other parts of the country, including New York. In fact, New York had some of the most intense, largest uh, civil rights campaigns in the nation. Didn't know that. Yeah. Um, one in particular, which I, I 
touch on in the black churches of Brooklyn because of uh, the church's role, in particular black ministers' roles in, uh, in, um, in this movement. Uh, but it's, it's my second book, uh, Looking at the Struggle for School Integration. Uh, it's entitled uh, "Knocking uh, Milton A. Glamison, uh, Knocking at our Do- Knocking at our Door," Milton A. Glamison, and the struggle to integrate New York City schools. And Glamison was a person who did not participate in the Southern civil rights campaigns. Uh, he is a person who was from Brooklyn. He was actually originally from Philadelphia. He, he did uh, come to Brooklyn in the late 1940s to become pastor of Siloam Presbyterian Church in Bedford Stuyvesant, which became the largest black Presbyterian church in the country, uh, claiming to have uh, 2,000 members. Now, by the Baptist standards, <laughs> that's small. Right. Yeah, uh, but uh, for Presbyterians, that, that's pretty large. And it's essentially it's Columbus who was attracting uh, loads of people, and it's its civil rights activities in particular that, that attract people. Would you say that's one, di- one difference that we're dealing with here in, in the present, which is, I mean, I, I'd heard this before, that the church played such a major role in the civil rights movement of the six, particularly the you know the African American church, in organizing folks. I mean, King was a pastor, son of a you know son of a son of a, a pastor, uh, and in fact, the organization he led, uh, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, which uh, he asked to add the Christian uh, piece to it. You know, uh, even though it was formed during his period, that was well, it was it was an organizing force. It was a very powerful force. Where now, I, I, you know, I think that America is still a very, as a very religious place. There's certainly, you know, most people would, I forget what the numbers are, that believe in God uh, as percentages, whether they practice it and go to church or not. There's, there's still a very, a lot of church activities going on, but it doesn't necessarily play a central role in the organization of the type of social protest that's going on right now. Uh, am I wrong? Yeah, well, I, I think there are some dynamic. Uh religious leaders uh, with us today, uh, the Reverend William Barber uh, comes to mind, uh, who is now leading the Poor People's Campaign, right? Uh, along with uh, uh, Liz uh, Theo Harris, the Reverend Liz Theo Harris, who happens to be the sister of Professor Jean Theo Harris, who's at uh, Brooklyn College. Um, and uh, Reverend Barber is one of the, I think, probably, in my opinion, uh, the most important moral voice uh, of our time. I mean, you know, we, we see the Reverend Al Sharpton, of course, playing a, a prominent role, although there are a lot of questions uh, about uh, both his past and present. Right. <laughs> uh, but uh, I mean, but there there are a number of religious, I think, um, activists and leaders uh, who um, are significant in, in terms of uh, the, the movement uh, that we have today. But yeah, but you're right. I mean, the, the focus on uh, a religious leadership sort of grew out of segregation, where yeah. institutions were, were close to uh, Americans, they couldn't go to war school, they couldn't go on to graduate school, those places were close to them. Right. Uh, the, the one institution that was open was uh, black churches. And so they, you know, really learned uh, a leadership style that became uh, quite vocal. And these institutions were, for the most part, independent of the larger white society. So uh, it nurtured an important leadership, and it's still doing that today. But now we have sort of great options, right? With people coming out of, uh, um, you know, professional institutions, law school, and you know, there, there is, uh, and there's always been, uh, an important secular left, 
uh, of activists. Right. Uh, some of them connected to left political parties. Some of them connected to the labor movement. Right. Uh, so, yeah. So, I mean, it's a lot. So the Which, uh, leadership yeah, it, activism is coming from many streams. Yeah. It's yeah. Like, well, I mean, again, to go back to the text, you know, uh, he did have a lot of King had a lot of folks he spoke to Ruskin, Ruskin, you know, Bernard uh, Ruskin, yeah, Ruskin, Ruskin, yes. Bernard, and uh, also, uh, I'm trying to remember, Stan, is it Stanley Levinson? Yes, who was Stanley the, uh, who, you know, again, Hoover had him down as a communist sympathizer, and he got a lot of pressure, particularly from presidents, to break that relationship uh, because they thought, you know, didn't, that he was a patsy. For, he, was, he was a sucker for for uh, for the Communist Party that was trying to work its way into uh, the civil rights movement. I mean, that's the picture that Hoover and the presidencies uh, were giving. So there's that strain runs from that period as well. Yes. And uh, well, let, let, let me let me note here that in New York, uh, Bay of Rustin, uh, some, some people call him Bayer Rustin. Also right. played a major role in the uh, New York City civil rights movement. Well, he was, yeah, he's, he he ran the offices right here, at least in, for, at different periods for the SCLC and and other groups. And he was well, this was his town, right? Well, well, yes, our guy. He lived, that's right. He lived in New York, but he also worked with Glamazon in the new the New York uh, City school integration struggle. Right. Uh, it's Glamazon who brings him along after this long, intense fight with the New York City public education to uh, get them to integrate the New York City school system, which the uh, leaders of the New York City Board of Education refused to do. And what uh, year are we talking about here? Well, we th this, this struggle, this intense struggle starts in the mid-1950s. Right. Uh, I mean, we can go back to the 1940s, and we see... Uh, uh, teachers, in particular uh, teachers who belong to something known as the Teachers Union. And that was a sort of communist-led um, um, teachers union, because there were several teachers unions that existed uh, uh, in New York City, but the, that branch was leading a fight to uh, integrate schools, eliminate the school system of racist textbooks, bias and racist textbooks, uh, and forcing, trying to force the New York City Board of Education to teach what they call Negro history <laughs> and hire uh, uh, black and brown teachers. Right. As in the 50s with Glamazon, who really starts working with parents throughout New York City, uh, getting them uh, to um, essentially take on their uh, racist school, uh, the racist school system. So he organized uh, boycotts, demonstrations, uh, along with uh, I mean, seasoned veterans <laughs> and activism. Uh, he managed to um, get uh, the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, its chapters in New York, as well as the Congress of Racial Equality, its chapters and the Urban League, all into one organization and threaten, and they did carry out what was the largest civil rights demonstration in the nation. In February, on February 3rd, 1964, when close to a half million children were kept out of the public schools in order to force the New York City Board of Education to come up with a plan and a timetable to integrate the school system. Wow. Yeah, so it was an amazing demonstration. It was a one-day boycott. And, you know, it's it's interesting because, again, like going back to the text, one of the things I found fascinating that I had assumed that everybody wanted to work together, you know, like the NAACP wanted to work with the SCLC and that you find out quickly that that's not a, that there are personalities involved. There are also simple things, you know, uh, for example, how they go about raising money, membership, uh, which really makes this very complicated. And again, uh, I don't know how it fits into the present because, uh, for example, I know that folks, they tell me, well, I'm giving money to Black Lives Matter movements. 
And I'm trying to think about, so what, it, what are you telling me? There's a, is there a clearing house, like one place you send the money and then they're spreading it to all the different uh, groups that are working? Uh, you know, uh, I don't know how that, how that works and how these things are coming together. But I know that it's a very complicated thing to do, financing social protest. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's right. But the big, the big issue, of course, is uh, ideology. And, and so Each there group. are ideolo right. ideological differences uh, right. in these groups. And, and, you know, that's why they form coalitions. And you don't have just one group, right? Right. <laughs> and, uh, 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 of course, uh, just like in the 1950s and 1960s, there was a lot of arguing, arguing going on, and, and mostly over ideology. You know, yeah. What was the, the best approach uh, to winning civil rights? Right. For example, I think King had a large issue with the Black Power movement because he felt it it went against his ideas of uh, you know nonviolence. You know this yeah. not. And so he, so he's pushing back a Stokey Carmichael or whoever it is uh, uh, who's involved. I mean, I won't even talk yeah. about the relationship with uh, with Malcolm X. Uh, right. But again, so it, you know, again the styles. And I know that King had a big focus on jobs. So we're, which is, you know, we're still that in that right. place. His, he felt that the focus needed not just on civil rights, but on, you know, he saw the financial piece of it, uh, right. which there was, in that, uh, you know, financial inequity in the country, as well as what you're talking about, you know, integrating the schools because of the, you know, this was this period that this was happening and voting rights, right? Uh, That's right. Because there was still a lot of Jim Crow behavior going on in the South, fighting, pushing back against even the uh, the legislation that was coming out of Washington at the time. Right. Yeah. So um, yeah, it, it, you, you're correct to, to, to talk about this sort of economic justice. And right. Champion. Uh, it's also a, a important to understand that the movement the, uh, before King and the 1930s and 1940s did focus on economic justice. But right. we had this thing called the Red Scare. Right. right. <laughs> we had uh, this, this period uh, where that component was equal. People who were champion economic justice were essentially uh, classified as uh, communist and traitors and they were marginalized. And so that component was, even though King and others raised it, um, some in the civil rights movement didn't want to touch the, the issue of economic justice. For fear of being labeled communists. That's right. They, 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 and they, they fought very hard against any sort of communist influence or what they saw as left influence in, in the, the uh, civil rights uh, movement. So that, I mean, that's one of the sort of ideological differences that, uh, that someone like King would have with uh, um, Roy Wilkins of the Na National Association of Advancement of Colored People, a more conservative civil rights organization. Right. It, it's interesting because now I guess the equivalent would be how folks in the right are calling everybody socialists. And that right. is somehow a dirty word, like Bernie's people, this idea that everybody would have health care or that everybody gets uh, some sort of minimum subsidy to, to live on, regardless of what their jobs are, whether they have a job or not. Uh, Social and you know that's thrown out there a lot. That's the the way this thing has has found itself uh, in the, the current movement, that's right? right? That, that's right. That's right. That's right. So um, uh, the um, whole idea of uh, calling people in the Black Lives Matter uh, 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 the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, these are anarchists, right? Right. We're hearing this not this nonsense, uh, and labeling these folks as you know anti-cop and so on, and right. so forth. 
and racist, right? Calling them racist or even using that, that phrase. And so we get this pushback, people saying all lives matter or blue lives matter and, and, and so forth. And it's a, a way of sort of d distorting what the real objectives of Black Lives Matter, you know, have been from the beginning. You know? um, and that is uh, essentially to uh, convince folks that the lives of Black people do matter because they are so undervalued in this society. And police brutality is a reality. You know, it's uh, nothing that's made up. <laughs> that does right. take place. It's and it's for me, it's about how all of these things get all mixed up. For example, the labor issue, because I read a very interesting piece by a police officer that said the real problem is that, you know, we, you know, police officers know this has been going on forever, but nobody says anything because, you know, this kind of blue wall of silence, uh, they don't call each other on their behaviors. And the union plays a role in that in defending police officers who, uh, go too far. And, uh, you know, so it's a, uh, so here it, where we think of, you know, for example, the, uh, we think of our union or PSC CUNY, the union is, is the good guy here. The union is not working with police officers. <laughs> yeah. Excuse me. I said not with police officers. Right. And so, you know, that is an institutional problem institution, meaning not just the greater institution of the United States, but with this particular, uh, institution within us who is you know supposed to be taking care of us protecting us but is engaged in the behavior of singling people out for violence and murder uh yeah. in, right. in some cases i'm not saying look i come from a family of cops from cuba you know long great grandfather grandfather uh you know cousins that are cops married and cops but i also you know i know what i know about the behavior sure sure and uh, and it's it's also we have to look at policy that's put in place also right you got to look at law that's put in place that protects um police officers um, um uh, even when they're committing uh, the most heinous acts yeah and lack so of civilian oversight and things like that right that's right. And having policies like uh, broken windows and uh, stop, question, and frisk in the place. That well, the Giuliani years, which you wrote about, right? Yes. Yes, <laughs> I did write about the Giuliani years, yes. And I also wrote about the Bloomberg years. Right. Yeah, you know, on the stop, question, and frisk, yeah. uh, where hundreds, hundreds of thousands of young men and women uh, – 90% of the people of color who were harassed by police officers uh, and they were innocent of any crime. Uh, so uh, that was policy. That was policy. So it wasn't just rogue police officers, right? I mean, this was condoned by essentially the highest encouraged. officials. Yeah, encouraged. Yeah, encouraged. Yeah, and power. Uh, by the way, I'm gonna, I'll tell you that we're in the last 10 minutes of the show, even less. And... Uh, uh, Professor Riccio says that, that we don't need any questions because the conversation's too good, uh, or the conversation is good enough already. <laughs> uh, but I did want to give you an opportunity. I don't know if you you, you are a professor emeritus. You've you know you've earned a rest. But is there something you're working on currently now that you'd like to talk about? Sure. Um, moving forward. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Um, I, I am working uh, on a book. Looking at the various responses that Black Americans had to the Holocaust, hmm. uh, I, I got interested in this project uh, some years ago when a friend of mine at the University of Vermont, uh, who uh, was in the the Jewish Studies program, and he, uh, taught a course on the Holocaust, uh, organized a conference in Jena, Germany, mm. looking at minority responses globally to the Holocaust. And he called me up and said, hey, Clarence, why don't you, I want you to do <laughs> the African-American response. And I said, well, it's something I really never really focused on, but uh, I did some research and became very interested. I gave a paper there four or five years ago, and then I decided I'm going to expand this into a book. 
and, and I was also encouraged by um, students. I mentioned I was in the Macaulay Honors Program and I always required the students to do a, 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 a paper. And many of the students uh, focused on uh, looking at uh, the, the black and white relations, Jewish relations, excuse me, uh, and black relations during the civil rights movement. And every single one of those papers detailed the role that uh, American Jews played in the civil rights movement. And so I would always ask the question, okay, well, what role did black folks play in addressing uh, Jewish suffering and oppression? None of the students could really answer that. So that really encouraged me. I said, you know, we need to do some more study on this. Right. So that, that's the project I'm working on. What have you just, uh, what have you found out? Are there any, any quick points that you could mention? That, yeah. That you're finding? Sure. Um, I think that we, we can't sort of overly romanticize uh, an earlier period when I do hear lots of people talk about this period where African Americans and Jews worked uh, together. That is true, I mean, to you know, eradicate uh, racial oppression. Uh, but, but yeah, I was fascinated by the number of African Americans and the institutions who came out uh, against, uh, who spoke out vehemently against uh, you know, what was going on in Germany. Uh, black newspapers, uh, black intellectuals, black artists uh, condemning um, the, what was going on in Germany and, and also the U.S. response to what, what was going on. Uh, I also found that there was a lot of tension in the 1930s between um, uh, African American and Jews. So it, it, it's it's not a romantic, we should not overly romanticize that period, but we do see it's a clearly a much more complicated period. And the, the tensions that people talk about um, emerging in the modern period, uh, some people blame it on uh, the rise of black power. And that's once again an oversimplification. Uh, some of those tensions I said existed earlier. And we do have tensions uh, uh, in the 1960s, 1970s, but clearly by the 1980s and 90s, there is a great deal of, uh, of tension, but also people who are, are fighting for cooperation. Now, some of that tension comes out of uh, black nationalists, for example, many black uh, uh, nationalists who were making the argument of this thing called the Black Hollow. Cards. Right. You know, uh, and there's been a big focus on on this thing called the Black Holocaust. Uh, who suffered, the, raising the question, who suffered the most, right? <laughs> uh, which is a question I, 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 I think that uh, you know, really does more harm than good. You know, we need right. to really sort of uh, look at this in uh, a, a way where we don't sort of have this sort of competition. But nevertheless, it does exist, right, uh, among, among certain people. And so I think right. a lot of uh, misunderstanding, a lot of ahistorical uh, analysis that, uh, that exists uh, that has led to this. And, and I think now that we're in this period, now the late, latest period, which I'm, I'm, I'm turning to, uh, gives us an opportunity to sort of solve some of these tensions that, that emerged, particularly in the 1980s and 1990s, especially with the rise of uh, anti-Semitic attacks along with the rise of white, white supremacy and, and so forth. So many black and Jewish leaders are seeing this, uh, this period where we need to sort of come together. Right? Sounds fascinating. And... Uh... And we can talk about it again because I want to have you on again. <laughs> I feel like sure. we've only started our conversation. We've mm -hmm. only had an hour, but we're running out of time. So I just want to, any last remarks you want to make or anybody you want to thank. I know uh, your wife is your uh, technical advisor. She was on the show helping us get all your equipment running. She did a good job. Yes, yes. 
<laughs> no, I, I could do it without her. I mean, it would be, right. well, I just put it this way, it would be very difficult uh, to, <laughs> to do it without her. Uh, so, yeah, I, I like to thank her. But, you know, I, I, I do want to go back uh, and, and make a point about um, this uh, idea of, of uh, racial oppression that exists in the United States. I mean, we, we can't really understand, or we'll never really address that problem unless we ad uh, address uh, both the racial aspect, but also the sort of class um, um, uh, part of uh, oppression and inequality in, in the United States. Uh, and, and so the civil rights struggle, the continuing civil rights struggle, because I say it's a sort of continuous struggle. We are not in a post-civil rights era. Yeah, and we're not doing so well in it either. <laughs> right. Precisely. We are not in a post-civil rights struggle. No, we're not. Uh, we're in it. That's right. Uh, I, I, and so I think that people should you know, be, be aware of that. Uh, uh, you know, this understanding of the past and look at uh, how people in the past organized, uh, how they were able to bring countless numbers of people, um, you know, to uh, demonstrations and campaigns. Uh, I mean, a wonderful period. We can learn a lot of lessons from that. And there's a lot of takeaways. But, you know, but giving credit to the, the new uh, sort of movement that has emerged that is clearly much more inclusive than it was in the 1950s and 1960s. Inclusive in terms of looking at um, gender, looking at uh, sexuality, right? Uh, you know, things that uh, were sort of uh, were not addressed in the 1950s and 1960s. I just want to thank you for being on my show, and uh, mm -hmm. folks watching, this is what's going on. I'm your host Hugo Fernandez, and uh, We've had the good fortune of speaking to Emeritus Professor Dr. Clarence Taylor of Baruch College and the CUNY Graduate Center, uh, who has published many books, including Fight the Power, African Americans, and the Long History of Police Brutality in New York City, Civil Rights in New York City from World War II to the Giuliani Era, and Black Religious Intellectuals, the Fight for Equality from Jim Crow to the 21st Century. And our discussion has been on the lessons to learn from the 50s and 60s civil rights movement as folks find themselves today in the Black Lives Matter movement. Thanks for being on my show. And Chris, take us Thank out. You. Amen. Thank you.